The first panel uh, features Rick, I'm turning around, and Laura Brown. Um, they are, you, you see their full bios uh, on, on the back of the flyer, and they're both professors uh, at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. You've seen them featured in the amazing documentary uh, that preceded this panel, so you sort of know who they are, but I'm sure you don't know what to expect in, from their presentation. And they, they have a respondent today, which is my fantabulous colleague, Laurie Starr, director of the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. So as, as you can see, this is a very much a Bay Area effort uh, today and uh, as it is often. So thank you for joining us and join me in welcoming our speakers. Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. That's a sign. <laughs> Laura and I are sculptors. We, you know, we've, we've been working, we've been making things with our hands uh, since we were, you know, first in college. And, um, and, and even back when we were in school, we had this idea uh, at that time that we thought that someday we would like to create a, um, our own, we didn't know what to call it, a school or uh, some place where we could bring people together to, to exchange ideas and, and make things in a new way. So it was an idea that started many years ago, but it wasn't until around, uh, late 90s that we actually created Hans House Studio. It became a 501c3 in 2001 or two. And so anyway, so Hans House, so we, we uh, built a studio and uh, we've been doing all our projects here just since that time. Uh, we didn't have any idea exactly how it was going to evolve, but uh, it was a, a, an idea that was uh, beginning to take legs. So um, the idea was, uh, that we proposed at that time was is that our, our interest is in replicating large historic objects as educational projects. And so uh, because we had a lifetime of building and, and, a, and a real pleasure in working with lots of different tools, lots of different technologies, lots of different uh, 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 processes, so it just came natural for us to, to teach this way by learn by doing. I'll, I'll read this to you. This will be the only slide I'll read. But uh, the hand is the cutting edge of the mind. Civilization is not a collection of finished artifacts. It is the elaboration of process. In the end, the march of man is the refinement of hand in action. Now, this is a this was a uh, this comes from Jacob Bernowski. He uh, he actually was an, uh, a mathematician who turned into a anthropologist. He wrote a book at that time called The Ascent of Man, and this is right when we were in undergraduate school when we read his book and we became very uh, engaged in his thinking. So this is the words he has. We believe in this idea of the hand is the cutting edge of the mind. So uh, I show you this, um, uh, also a book we read in, in when I was in high school, uh, Thor Heyerdahl's uh, Kantiki. Uh, young Thor Heyerdahl, um, there was a, actually, at, at that time, there was this widely accepted theory that the people that were inhabiting this uh, island in the middle, middle of the Pacific Ocean had come from the, uh, the, the west, which would be, be an Asian country. And uh, when Thor Heyerdahl was in, in school, he said, well, why couldn't they have come from the East? And the response uh, was is that that's ridiculous. Those cultures did not have the skills to get there. Well, he, didn't, he wouldn't accept that. So what he did was he went to Chile and Peru, studied early craft from these cultures. He, he made a replica as accurate as possible. He set sail, and sure enough, he landed on the island. And since that time, this idea of experimental archaeology has kind of taken hold. That is the idea of trying to learn about a culture by replicating their history. And so we, we really believe strongly that there are things you can learn by replication uh, or uh, reverse engineering that you can't learn in any other way. So this is something that we, we embrace very early on. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Shinto shrine in, um, in Japan. Uh, they were also very attracted to this idea. The first uh, temple uh, was built 2,000 years ago. But every year since that time, every 20, yeah, I'm sorry, every 20 years, they replicate, the, uh, they replicate the original object. That means that every time they've done a replication, that somebody is there that was present on the time before, going all the way back to the original building. So they have uh, held dear this idea, almost deified this idea of, of preserving that original maker's way of thinking, a way of doing, and the tools that they use and, and, and the methods. So again, we're very uh, you know, in, uh, inspired by this way of thinking. 
So uh, with Hans House, we were very lucky. Right in the very beginning, we started getting some really incredible projects that came our way. Uh, this is one we did with PBS's Nova, uh, where the, the, their, what they were looking for was a credible theory on how the Egyptians would raise an obelisk. Now we know that the Egyptians wrote down everything. They, they recorded through models and, and through hieroglyphs, everything they did. But for some reason, they didn't write down or record how they raised the obelisk. So Nova wanted to find some credible way of doing that. Well, we were very lucky. Uh, we had got an opportunity to actually uh, compete uh, with engineers from around the country. And, uh, and we were uh, selected to do our theory on how the, the Egyptians raised the obelisk. Okay, so that meant we got to work with some pretty amazing uh, uh, materials and, and, and the process and, and track a lot of people. But one of the things that we uh, insisted to uh, with, with NOVA is, is we said we're an educational organization. Uh, we, we want to be incredibly accurate. We're not just, we, we don't want to do something that's just going to be showmanship. We want to be as accurate as possible. So one of the things that we did was we said we always, anything, any theory we have, uh, we want to base it on some kind of historic precedent. So all the ideas we established that we we're going to play out, we would find some sort of historic uh, example or something that we could reference to give credibility to our solution. The one on the left is an example of um, uh, a, a drawing from a, uh, a, a tomb. And what it shows is it shows the pharaoh uh, lifting the two, two obelisks. Well, one of the uh, issues at that time was with PBS's Nova, they, they were saying, or the director said, uh, when we bring this thing to a certain angle, uh, they, then they, they, uh, what, what they want to do is that they want to make it in an angle that's so steep that it might create some more difficulty to, to do the final raising. It, that, what that was is based on trying to create a, uh, a spectacular show, and we were saying, no, no, no. We don't believe that they would bring it in at a lower angle. They would bring it in at, at, uh, at 70 degrees, because that's an angle where they can then make that final lift with, with maximum or optimum control. And so they said, no, no, we want, we want uh, 50 or 60. Well, I found this drawing, and uh, I, I literally put a uh, calculator. It's actually 70 degrees. So, so in other words, they said, OK, we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> that's the kind of evidence we try. We can't say for sure that's exactly accurate, but at least it is credible uh, uh, argument for, for, for the theory. So anyway, so that's the kind of, we're always trying to find those kind of uh, precedents. Uh, here's another project we did shortly after that uh, with uh, uh, Discovery Channel. They wanted to, to replicate uh, the American Revolutionary War submarines called known as the Turtle. Uh, they wanted a, a working replica. Now, this is not the uh, Civil War uh, submarines. This is, a, this is a Revolutionary War submarine. So this was built in 1775. We, again, we thought this was a perfect Hans House project because it involves so many different skills, blacksmithing, copper raising, glass blowing, uh, wood carving, bronze casting. And then also yeah, they made, we made gaskets with lamb's wool and lanolin, beeswax, everything they were done just at the same time. But what we do in, in our workshops, uh, we, we use pretty much the same uh, method each time. We have these uh, intense workshops where we bring in some, often some of the best scholars on the subject. Uh, we will bring in educators and historians. We'll bring in anthropologists, archaeologists. We'll bring in the uh, traditional craftsmen, uh, artists, again, sometimes the best in the world. So uh, in, this, in this case, we, we had 75 people in that, in that were a bunch of experts, but also students. We built this in 12 days. So if people come on the site, they come to Hans House. With our students, basically all you have to do is feed them, and they'll do anything. And uh, so they come to Hans House. People, this, uh, we have the um, uh, experts are staying in our house or in uh, houses of our neighbors and students are camping or they're traveling back and forth or all just bunking in in our house and so in 12 days we made this replica and uh, and then at that time we took it uh, and this is in early January we took it down to Duxbury Harbor and tested it and it, and it functioned well and so because it, fu it functioned as it was planned it ended up going uh, directly from there to the uh, uh, Annapolis, Maryland at the Naval Academy and where we tested it in their test tank. So this is now turning it over to some of the best submariners in the world. And so this is how our projects work. They, ha they have this kind of mystique about them that can attract the most amazing people and students to work together to achieve the goals. So intensive workshops. Another thing we always do is we always begin with an object. We don't begin with a subject. In other words, here, for example, this is a human-powered crane project we did. 
Uh, it looks like the image in the lower right corner of this uh, uh, etching. Uh, but what we did is uh, the, um, we would take an image like that, just put it on the wall. You may have heard this in the film. We put it on the wall at school and ask students, how would you like to build this? You know, and so then from there, we just start the process, asking questions and go through all the lines of inquiry. We usually questions asked by students, try to figure out what it was made of, the tools, the t methods, cross-referencing everything we can find uh, historically building a more credible uh, knowledge and information base to make our uh, replica as best as possible. And then when, once we get to the point where we feel confident, we jump into actually building it. So here we are now, building the crane full scale. You can see it's quite large. It's like 50, the main arm is like 50 feet. And using the same tools and technologies they used at, at the time. So again, the, uh, what we do is we believe that uh, uh, what happens ultimately is, you know, if, like I said, if we had, offered this class and said, okay, we're going to study the history of France in 1750, uh, it would have just been, uh, I would have been standing in the classroom doing this alone. But uh, I, we offered this class, say, how would you like to build this? And at the end of the project, everybody knew about the history of France in 1750. They learned about the social, political, economic forces that came together at that time to make that thing possible through their natural interest and following their own curiosity and following their own lines of inquiry. So that's another method we use at Hans House. Um, also, we, you know, we have some, some fun things that come to us. Uh, PBS went to, uh, to Egypt again to, to, to do a show on the, on the Sphinx. And they came back and uh, they said, we've got the film finished. And the producers looked at it and said, uh-uh, we want, we want some action. And then the director says, what do you mean? We spent all the money. He said, I don't care. We want some action. So, uh, so at that time, there was a person standing next to this conversation who had done some writing about our project, and he said to the director, you better call Hans House. <laughs> They'll have an idea for you. <laughs> so what we did is was we suggested that um, they asked us if we could help them. And we said, yeah, we can. Uh, well, we, how about we carve the sphinx nose? <laughs> <laughs> now, so the, thing, the, pro the problem is, is that we wanted to do it full scale. But on his zero budget, <laughs> we only do it this size. <laughs> But anyway, so this is a, a lot of amazing projects have come our way to be able to stu study these, these uh, uh, objects that are from different time periods, different cultures, and different technologies. All just wonderful examples of, uh, that provide a fantastic uh, learning journey for ourselves and uh, scholars and our students. Okay, so, um, so when we were building the Crane Project, this is back in, uh, 2002 or three, uh, there was a professor from New York University who came to us. Uh, he was you know, working with us, and he said he heard that in Poland there was an interest in, uh, they were actually going to have a conference. They're trying to bring people from around the world, and the interest was in uh, the possibility of replicating a 17th or 18th century wooden synagogue, and would we be interested? Now, again, if you saw the film, we're not Jewish, we're not Polish. But we, he showed us a photograph, and, and as soon as I saw that, I said, this is going to be an amazing project. And so our answer was yes. He connected us with this, uh, the, the, the people in, in Poland. They invited us to come to this conference. The conference was people from all over the world, mostly um, museum curators. Uh, there were also people from Skansen's, which are outdoor ethnographic museums that they have all over Europe. There were traditional builders, builders organizations that had the skills to build a synagogue. Uh, and so, but it, so we, we went to that conference. It was, uh, it was fantastic. It was our first introduction into this history. And so right away we thought, oh, this, is, this, is, this is something that's very important and we don't want to not continue this. But after that conference, uh, what happened was is that they had, we had the skills there to build it. Um, they didn't have any uh, funding. And, and also what we proposed, we were the only uh, educational organization there, we said, you know, we have all these skills, we could build this thing, I'm sure, but we don't know anything about this history. This is a much, this is a much better opportunity to, to learn about this history. And over the time we're learning about it, we call it, let's develop an international learning network. Let's work with people all, all around, the, on the, around the world, scholars and historians and, and, and builders, and we can do this in a much more intelligent way. And then, then there'll be a day when we can do this, where we can do it really, and be much more effective. 
And so uh, after everybody left in that conference, it really kind of just vaporized anyway. They just didn't have the funding and nothing happened. But we, we decided we're not going to give up on this. And when we came back, we decided we're, what we're going to do is we're going to create a class. We're going to make a replica of the Zabuda Synagogue, because that's the one that they suggested that they would like to build. And so we, um, uh, what we had to work with were uh, these drawings and the photographs that were done. You can see they're dated in the left-hand corner. These, are, uh, these drawings were done uh, by, a, by faculty and students from the Warsaw Polytechnic Institute. And what they did is they went out into the countryside and they documented these, these synagogues very thoroughly. And, uh, and that material survived the war. We don't know exactly how it survived. You know, uh, during the war, uh, you know, Warsaw was 97% destroyed. But somebody had the wherewithal to hide these documents. They made their way back. And I, I'm not sure if it was the Pihutkas who actually retrieved it. But in the, in the film, you, you saw Maria Pihutka as a young, she and her husband, young architects. They were, at, they were going to school right before the war at Warsaw Polytechnic Institute. They knew about this project. And so when they returned, they, uh, they were determined to salvage this information because they knew if they didn't, it would be lost forever. And so, so here we are now. We have uh, we have access to these documents, the drawings, plan sections, elevations, and photographs. And so we're going to we're going to use those. And at this time, we're telling our students, you know, our our we have a big idea here. We have a big dream. One day, our goal is to replicate uh, one of these synagogues full scale. And so we're starting at the beginning, and and we're going to do everything we can to to get to the point where we can do this with some credibility. And um, so the first thing we did was, you can see, we literally took the uh, uh, the elevations, uh, printed, printed those at a, at a larger scale, 12 to 1, and uh, we uh, made it, it made our model of the, the first few days uh, of the synagogue to get, see, get a sense of the massing and see how big a model we would like to, to build in wood. Uh, so this is, this is a very important moment because, see, again, this is, these are students who are signing up for this uh, project, uh, most of them not knowing this history of the Polish Jews and or the history of these synagogues. And, uh, but they're attracted to the idea of, of building a, uh, the idea of someday maybe building the same full scale. So, um, so the first thing we did is we translated it into a massing model. Then we started translating that into actual materials. And what we decided was, uh, and again, this is students deciding. We decided we wanted to make it big enough so that we could make a model where we could actually, uh, it was a scale where we could actually make uh, connections or, uh, or look at the joinery. and and the different details of how the uh, synagogue is constructed so it, we could use it eventually for a construction model. And then also to make it big enough to be uh, very impressive because we're going to use it to popularize the subject. The idea is we're going to exhibit this thing and try to get people around the country and perhaps around the world interested in this idea and, and, and build a culture around this notion of uh, the importance of retrieving and rebuilding one of these uh, synagogues. So, so here the students are, you know, uh, again, very dedicated. Um, the, uh, the, we, had a, we had a workshop that we, we, we quickly scheduled because uh, it turned out that they were, they were at the uh, Timber Frame Guild in, um, in the, uh, it was having a conference in the U.S. and they were inviting some people from uh, traditional builders from the Czech Republic to come to the U.S. And because Boston was on the way, we said they could stay at our house. <laughs> and so that we, so we were able to convince them to come to our house. And we had, then we also knew that uh, Mark Boronsky, he was from the Ministry of Culture. He's the gentleman with a tie on right on the left. He, he was the person who had this idea about replicating a synagogue full scale in Poland. I think originally it was not his idea, but he was the person who took this idea and created this conference. So he was going to be in town for another uh, presentation. We, so we were able to convince him to come to our, our workshop. N standing next to him is Ed Levin, who is a, uh, a timber framer and engineer and uh, sort of a, the, the, the timber frame guild sort of uh, uh, in-house poet. And we worked on all our projects we had ever done with uh, Hans House. Uh, we did with Ed Levin. And, uh, uh, you saw in the film, we actually dedicated the film to Ed Levin because uh, he, he died shortly before the museum opened. It, was, it broke our hearts because he had spent so much of his time and effort to make that project a success. But, so Ed was at this conference, and then you see in the middle here, Tom Hufka with, with the uh, baseball cap on. Tom Hufka wrote the book with Splendid Synagogue. And, uh, and this is so important because when we were on the plane, 
Laura and I are on the plane, sitting next to Ed Levin. Uh, Ed Levin uh, says to me, he says, Rick, I got something I want to show you. He reached into his bag and pulled out this uh, a uh, publisher's proof. The book, book hadn't even been published yet. He says, this is Tom Hupka. He wrote a book on the Australian synagogue. It's a, it's a comprehensive study of one synagogue. And I'm going, let me see that. This is you, You're making this up. And, and I, I saw this, and I said, oh, my gosh, this is fantastic. This is, this is, you know this guy? And he said, oh, yeah, because he wrote another book called Little House, Back House, Little, Big House, Little House, Back House Barn, but stuff, because he had an interest in vernacular architecture. So as soon as we came back from Poland, uh, we, uh, we said, we've got to get in touch with Tom Hupton, which we did. And then he became a partner very early on in the project. This is very important because this is, again, these projects attract some of the best scholarship in the world. So here's an example of uh, Tom Hupka who wrote this book that's uh, the most comprehensive study of any single synagogue. And when we, uh, we started inviting him to come with us to do lectures and to speak to our students and to, and, and to inspire them. And, um, and so uh, Tom told us in the early part of our, our meeting each other, he said, he said, I, I spent uh, 15 years researching this book, uh, and he said, never in my wildest dream that I ever believed that anybody would imagine trying to replicate one of these things. So he wanted to be part of our project, and he stuck it out with us for years. I, I want to add to that that actually at this, at this uh, workshop, which was in 2003, we had our first lecture that we put together, which was Tom Hupka and Anthony Polonsky, yeah. uh, who came and has been our scholar uh, for Polish history from the very start. And, and that was, a, uh, it's amazing that, that he actually stepped forward at that time too. So, so what's so important here is, is that um, what, we're, what we're doing is we're attracting people who can speak about these subjects with real authority. You know, we, we have this big idea and we have a certain skill set, but we're, we're attracting people who have a real knowledge of this history. And, and, and uh, it, by virtue of having them take part, they start to give credibility to our project. People often ask us, where do you get funding? Well, the thing, we, we, we basically, what we, what we tried to do is sort of get the ball in the air and keep it in the air. So, so you have to see, when we did the model project, uh, what we've done is, is that we make this model, and, uh, and then we, we have this beautiful object, so then we want to show it. So we figure if we can show it, then that's going to get more attention. So we, we make an arrangement to show it um, in Wisconsin, where Tom taught. <laughs> We show it uh, at Oberlin College, which is on the way to Wisconsin. Uh, we, and it turns out on the way back, we showed it as a National Yiddish Book Center. Uh, so in other words, you rent a truck, and it's, go it's going to be going a certain direction. You ask the people, uh, you ask the institutions, can you give us a little bit of money to show, have to show this piece? They'll give you a little bit of money. Once they do that, then you go to the uh, history pro program and say, can you bring in a, a, someone who's going to lecture on the history of Euro European Eastern Europe, or you go to the Jewish Studies program and say, can you provide a, uh, money to bring in um, an expert like Mark Epstein who can talk about Jewish icono painting and iconography. And so then you just keep building this project out of just little pieces of money and funding and, and a lot of begging. And, uh, and so this is how it works. So then in a very short period of time, we've now made this model on just a small class budget. It's now traveling to uh, venues around the country, bring, attracting amazing scholars. And uh, so, so this is how the Hans House Project works. Like here, for example, again, we have all, here you see uh, Magda uh, Pazinski. She's also a, an anthropologist from Poland. She came to our workshop. You see that we have historians. Uh, the, uh, the people are just walking on because they want to be part of the project. I can't go through all the names. <laughs> so again, what we're doing is you know, we're, we're using those drawings that, we, we, uh, that were, uh, the Hutt has published in their book. And uh, you can see this is our model making exactly what they're doing. We're trying to realize those images and make it so it's tangible and understandable and buildable. And uh, uh, along the way, we, uh, we always like to document the people who participate because there's so many. You know, uh, in the film today, we said there are over 300 people who participated. Uh, and that's the 300 who participated in the project in Poland alone. There were probably 300 who participated uh, in the years up to that point. So, um, so in this group, there's a lot of characters here who were very important, very significant in their contribution to make this happen. And from the professionals who, again, and then here there are people from the Czech Republic, there are people in here from uh, uh, Poland, and then there's uh, some expert timber framers and a lot of students. And if I went around, I could tell you all these students. Some of them came in as freshmen, 
Then they went on to graduate school, school. Some of them are teaching now. Some have professional practices. But these are the people who are making these projects ha happen. They're dedicating their time. They're focused. They're very serious. They think this is a very important project. And they really throw themselves at it. So they're all very important to, to us. Uh, again, this is an example of a, a, a Pihutka uh, 3D view, beautiful cutaway version. We're making our model just to mimic their drawing, just one to one. So it helps us see the building from the inside out, see the envelope, and also see the structure. And uh, so we're, again, we're just we're relying on those experts. They're helping us make, move forward on a, this realization of the idea. Same thing here. That here's your. This is a photograph from Zimmerman Zizek in 1939. You know, he was one of the uh, faculty members at Warsaw uh, Polytechnic Institute who created this project, and that's his photograph. And here's uh, a view of our model to mimic his, that image. Now, this is what happens. This is uh, students replicating or making the model. Now, the students, I remember the first day, students, some students were kind of joking. They said, we're going to make every single shingle on this model. Then I remember after about four or five weeks, I said, we're going to make every single shingle on this model. Their attitude changed. They all of a sudden got so dedicated, they're going to do this exactly right. And so what happened was is that as they're making this model, based on these draw architectural drawings, they're, what they're finding is, is that there's, it's questionable whether they have enough information from a, uh, an elevation view of, uh, of, of the building. So that they're saying, you know, it doesn't make sense. If you look at the Buddha, the front uh, door has this kind of decorative element that is not structural. And so I'd say, okay, just write, any questions you have that we can't answer, write them down. And after a period of time, they had a pretty good number of questions that they had raised like this. And so I said, okay, the only way we're going to resolve this is to go to Poland. Because we ha what we've got to do is we've got to go to Poland and go find a building built in the same proximity, same time, and walk inside and see if we can't find those details. And then once we do, we'll understand what happened on the other side. And, and that, that happens so many times. I remember this day where the student came running to me. We were at the Skansen in, uh, in, in Poland. He came running to me saying, Rick, I found the door. I found an example just like the Zabuda door. And he says, I now understand it. When he went in the inside, you could see, in fact, there was a transition from the front to the back. There was a structural component in this complex joint that you couldn't see from the outside. So they were so excited, they photographed it, they, uh, they drew it, they even did rubbings. They were so excited about what they had learned, but they were retrieving very important information. So when we replicated the synagogue, it was going to be as accurate as possible. And they went through Poland scouring for summers, scouring these structures, looking for all those things that they had raised questions about, and, and for the most part, they found the solutions. So, um, so, you know, we're looking at structural elements, we're looking at... Um, Decorative elements, we're looking at all, as many things as we can to give us ourselves a better understanding so we can make an accurate replica. We took students into the attics of many, many churches, and uh, that was really exciting. So yeah. See the, so. mm -hmm. and here, here is this detail that uh, you can see in this drawing on the left that's kind of decorative detail. Here it is in uh, Zabrysz Gornie uh, in Poland. And this is the photograph, this is Zimmon Zizek photograph of the other image on the top. And so this is where students found, the, they found the question and we followed their line of inquiry until we came to a resolve. So it was the students who were, were raising these questions and finding the solutions. This is where we, we tell our students, students can make history. And we told them also what we're doing is we're just following in the good work, in the, the, the uh, footsteps of the good students from 1923 in Poland who were working with their faculty members and marching around trying to find and document these buildings. So they, they realized that now they are part of a, of a big, significant, worldwide project to, to re recover a very significant uh, piece of art and architecture. There was another effect, actually. We, we go to these little villages in Poland bringing uh, travel programs where students are paying to go for two weeks into a little village and document a church. Because uh, the churches were generally the only uh, wooden buildings that remained, and the, the village would go, "You're doing what? You're coming <laughs> here with pay, pay, being paid to come? Uh, they're paying to come here to crawl in the attics and document our church. Well, our church must be pretty important too. So it kind of brought uh, as well. I'm not saying that it wasn't, but there was this yeah. this double recognition that actually." Uh, you know, this is incredible information. The, the, the uh, material culture, the wooden cultural heritage of Poland is significant. 
It's very significant in the project, and this kind of uh, celebrates that. So again, this, so they're back at Hans House, and they're now they're looking at uh, uh, how to actually build, take a log and convert it into a, a dimensional piece of lumber, and how to make joinery. And they're working with professional timber framers. And I mean, uh, uh, Piet Rizika is from uh, the Czech Republic. I mean, I can I can almost go as far as to say he's one of the he's the, the best uh, hewer in the, uh, in the on the in the planet. He's he's, he's studied hewing uh, like uh, forensically. Uh, he has uh, he's has probably 150 axes that he's had reproduced uh, that he uses so he, he he can compare German timber framing to English timber framing to Czech timber framing to Polish timber framing and uh, and, and, and understands by studying buildings very cl closely, uh, how they uh, each different culture would do the same task of hewing a log, but how they would do it in a different method. Some move forward, some move backwards, some work from uh, lower on the ground, some work higher. So he thoroughly understands this history. So we brought him in, and he can tell the students that this is a, a very sophisticated uh, technology that's, uh, that's a, a, a very specific sort of um, anthropological uh, science, and so uh, this. So in other words, students again are learning th on this level of building how significant this these techniques are. It's not willy nilly. It's not arbitrary. It's actually very ingrained in the culture. And uh, so, so again, so here we are. We're using this method of uh, what they call pit saw. It's a frame saw where there's a person above and below. Many cultures use this technique. In this, these photographs, we're doing it in our studio at Hans House, where we have a hole in the floor. But then we uh, became more authentic. We went outside and built a what they call a goat, this, this uh, trestle, and we're doing the process just as they would have at that time. Here's an image from Italy in eight, uh, 1350. You know, this this technology goes way back. It's cross-cultural, and uh, so uh, we're doing the same way that they did. And students are so they get to understand the idea about also about. Um, about labor, how much labor it takes to get something done. So you start to understand, start to project how much, how, how, many, how, how long would it take to build something and how many people would it take to do it. And uh, so anyway, so uh, after they had discovered this thing about the Zabuda of Door, they came back and said, we want to make a replica of the Zabuda of Door. Uh, every, everything, they get excited about everything. So uh, you, you look at this kind of interesting, you look there and you see this is the actual size of the Zabuda of Door. It's only about a little over five feet tall. So you see, you're thinking from the drawings that that's a, a huge, huge doorway. No, it's actually quite small. That's, that's very specific information that, that uh, can give a lot of interest or uh, information about the synagogues. So, um, okay, so then we, we shifted from Zabudov to Gavorges. This is where we decided, okay, now we, uh, we, we want to uh, look at the, the, um, the interiors because the interiors were polychrome, these very complicated uh, uh, paintings. Then they went from the, the, the floor up to the top of the wall and then the entire ceiling. And uh, so we, um, we had the best documentation of the Gavorgia synagogue and so we decided we we're going to replicate this. Uh, I, I remember the first day we met in this class and I said, okay, well here's what our objective is. We're going to replicate this thing full scale and have it done by the end of the semester. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, you know, my, my students, I know they're going like, this guy, is, is, he, is he for real? <laughs> Anyway, got she, uh, the, uh, after about halfway through the semester, and hadn't, we hadn't put one single p brush paint on the stroke on the paper, a couple of students said, Rick, uh, we're not going to pay attention. We're going to go over here and do something. And what they did is they went across the room, and they made a full-scale painting of one of the, um, the uh, lions. And they held it up and said, first of all, there's no way <laughs> we're going to do this painting full-scale this semester. They said, let's, let's look at this more realistically. What, how can we proceed from here? And so what the, 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 stu the student said, let's make this thing half scale, and it's probably more doable. And I said, okay, that's where we're going to go with. So this, so this is where students are also directing the class based on uh, their perception of what our goals are and what's possible, and, and, and just based on what they feel is the right thing to do. So we spent uh, the rest of that semester working on a half scale painting of this one section. and. Um, yeah. Okay, we're going to show that. Okay. So uh, now again, uh, as you saw in the film, one of our uh, big, most challenging issues was color, and we had um, uh, we had one example. As Laura says, this is a thing that came from a, a study 
where the, uh, an anthropologist was in the synagogue looking at this, this image, copying it as accurately as possible, and we, we found a lot of very valuable information here, but the most important for us was the, uh, the color palette. And so now everybody in the room knows that if you took a photograph of a, of a, uh, of a painting and you uh, reproduced it and then reproduced it again and then you print it, it's not going to be actual color. But what it did was it gave us the range of colors, where blues were, where uh, reds were, where yellow, green. And so that was a very valuable document. That was our Rosetta Stone for color. This is also a painting. This is a painting done by Isidore Kaufman uh, in 1897 to 98. And so now this is an artist, a fine artist, also in the synagogue and painting that image. And so, uh, so what this is, is a, now this, is, this is a painting a couple, year, a couple hundred years after it was original, originally painted. And so this brought up a discussion with our students. We said, OK, what's our objective? Are we, we going to try to paint it to make it look like it would look like today? Or are we going to paint it like the day it was originally painted? And so the students, we had this, this discussion. We said it, it, would, be, uh, it would be unfaithful. It would be, be kind of a mistake to try to be, take a romantic view and do it like it, uh, and project what it would look like. Let's paint it like it would have been done at that originally. And so that's the, that's the path we took. And so, um, and so then this is where we said, okay, we've got to do some real serious painting uh, color study because we'll have limited information. So again, we continued our travel programs to Poland, and we went to a, a number of churches that were in the same proximity. This is uh, this is from a church just a little bit north of uh, Gwoźdź called Drohobich. It was built maybe 25 or 50 years before Drohobich. And it was amazing the kind of the similarities between the iconography, which is Christian iconography, but, but Christian iconography, and then the, well, the, then the, the painting in, uh, in, in Gavorges. Although stylistically, they're very, very different because the, the Christian churches were more narrative. They were more uh, about perspective and about being uh, more about form and, and, and being more natural. And, it's, and, and so, and, but in, and in, in the uh, Gavorgis, they're much more pictorial. They're plain, they're, they're like playing on a surface. They're silhouetted. Uh, they're organized in a much more architectural way. Uh, so there's, there's some, some influences, but there's, there's, Gavorgis was definitely a Jewish, particularly a Jewish style of painting. And so the students are seeing this, but what they're studying here is they're really focusing on the color. And they're looking at the brush strokes and trying to figure out how they would lay color on. And, uh, and so they, they, again, after a number of summers, they're, they're getting an enormous amount of information about painting. Okay. Uh, also, uh, it says in the film, one of the first things we did when we started this class uh, was we had the students make a cardboard uh, image of the, the, the form of the, of the gorgeous ceiling. And we thought that they should, they should under, understand, to understand this, they would have to go through the process of agonizing how they're going to make, replicate this form. And so every one of them did it individually. Uh, and so that was a very, that was an important step. Also, I, I said in the film, at that point, somebody said, this looks like a, a tent. And which Tom Hufka believes uh, com com completely. Here, here's, uh, this is uh, Case Randall who has uh, painted this image that day and said, Rick, look at this line. This is full scale. This thing, this is huge. There's no way we can do this. But this is where, again, this is where in our, our pedagogy, we don't try to impose on the students that we're the authorities and that they're working for us. What we try to establish is, is that we're all doing this for the first time together, and we all are going to learn from this. And there's no, no hierarchy. Everybody will make a contribution. Everybody will learn. And that's what, how it works. I'm going to kind of click through them. Uh, okay, okay. All right. Yes. So, I'll, because so I'm just going to kind of show you. This is all workshops done on the half scale painting model, which we did for about six years prior to, to even arriving, uh, starting with the museum. And uh, these are, are uh, in different places with different uh, students at different times, a lot of tracing. Uh, how, do, how do you gather, how do you re retrieve the image from the photographs? Uh, a lot of uh, study of color and mixing and, and dealing with the traditional paints, uh, uh, details, of just hours and hours and hours of just looking and replicating at the half scale. So all of this is actually uh, still ex is still in our workshop. So that we have a whole half scale example of the painting that's in Warsaw. 
over here in our uh, in, on wood done uh, before we even started that project. Actually, uh, I want to point out here, down here at the bottom, there's a picture of someone in the audience. Savannah. <laughs> Savannah. De Vecuera, she's De one of our students who started out years ago, stuck with us, went through the whole of the project in Poland, and still continues to support us today. We should give her a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Savannah is one of our, our painting leaders uh, that, that really are, were so critical in making a, 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 bringing our success to the project. So, um, and, and we always take uh, group pictures at the end of each class or each workshop because that's important for them to see what they have done and to celebrate their, their uh, accomplishments. So here's the eight panels or eight sections of the ceiling, half scale, and the, and the eight groups. And you can see the dates. This is in 2005. This is the first one. And there are people in here that are on the final one. Uh, the second one, this was done at Oberlin College in a 10-day workshop. The third one uh, was done in 2007. You can see at the time just kind of marching on. Uh, this is the uh, west wall. No, excuse me. This is the, the what does it say? <laughs> this is the yeah, west, west dome. We, we call, would it, call the it dome. 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 Uh, this is the east dome. Uh, this is done in 2008. Uh, by this time, we were actually, had, Barbara had met us, and we yeah. were kind mm -hmm. of still proceeding just the way we had all along. This is uh, Oberlin College again, where we went back and did a workshop there in 2009 and did the pendentives on the, uh, on the east and the east side. And then this is the final workshop where we really completed the whole ceiling half scale. 2009. 2009. And at the same time, we did a, the BEMO workshop. <coughs> so, so while we're doing these other painting workshops, we're also trying to do some uh, uh, other more three-dimensional workshops as well. So uh, what we did here was we offered a class where we decided we're going to uh, replicate the beam of full scale and, uh, or, or one section of the beam because you can see it's eight-sided. So in that class, uh, on the top left, you can see we, we made that one section. It took us a whole semester. And at the end of the semester, what I did was I said, uh, raise your hand if you'd like to come back to Hans House this summer. We're going to have an eight-day workshop, and we're going to build the whole thing from ground up. Everybody raised their hands. We invited some more people, and we had 25 people who came to Hans House, and we replicated the, 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 the entire uh, BEMA uh, in that workshop. And then shortly after that, we took the BEMA. At this time now, we had the BEMA done. We had all the half-scale painting done. We had a model of Zabudov and a model of Gavoj. It's the same big scale. We had the, uh, also, we had the um, uh, front door of the Zabudov synagogue. And we had a comprehensive exhibition at Oberlin College because they had become kind of a partner with us. They were so excited about the project, they kept inviting us to come back. And which meant we also uh, could take our, uh, what we, we would say is, is we're going to bring our experts with us because we would take students who had been working on the project at Mass Art, we would take them to work with their students and their faculty. And so we we're, again, uh, gathering uh, more and more dedicated members of the, our community. And we had this exhibition there which was very important because then this, what happens now is, is that, you know, this work is getting published in their alumni magazine. It's getting published in other uh, magazines around the state. And so it's giving a recognition to the project and, and more credibility, and more, which means more invitations for lectures and workshops. And, uh, and then what happened was then we uh, met Barbara Kirsten Black Gimlet, and we found out that they're uh, going to be building a museum of the history of Polish Jews. And uh, we have been doing this, this research and that they had been planning this museum for quite some time. And so, um, and this was kind of a magic moment because, uh, because <laughs> now that we, we um, had an opportunity to actually fulfill this bigger dream we had originally and, and, as, and not knowing where it was going to be. Uh, and they had this big dream about you know, building a, uh, a, a new museum. And so we coming together, it gave us an opportunity to use the Hans House method incorporate many, many students and professionals from around the world and, and reproduce it uh, at, at, at this scale. So, yes, okay, I'll stop there. Um, I have a brief response, so thank you for asking me to respond. Uh, first, I want to respond uh, to this as art, as artists and work of art. And then I want to talk about it from a museological standpoint, and then I want to talk about it from a personal standpoint. So I'll try to be fast. First and foremost, what Rick and Laura do 
really uh, is another example of how artists can really be agents of social and cultural change uh, in the work that they do as educators and as people who teach by doing, which is the workshop method that uh, John Dewey in the 30s in America uh, really brought out into the public sector in terms of teaching art that you learn by doing. And uh, there is a through line to Jewish history here because so much of this workshop method that was brought to the US through educators originated in Europe at the Bauhaus uh, where many Jewish artists uh, were able to escape from Germany at the beginning of the Nazi takeover and actually bring this workshop method to the US. And I thought you'd all um, find an interesting through line with Designing Home, Jews in Mid-Century Modernism, which was an exhibition the CJM had a couple of years ago. It looked at the points of intersection of artists like yourself um, and where they intersected uh, with Jewish artistic emigres to America and those points of contact. So you're reminding me of Black Mountain College, which was one area of incredible activity. Um, another being the um, Institute of Technology in Chicago, uh, the great uh, place of architecture and design, uh, where a lot of Jewish emigre artists came and were welcomed uh, into this environment, again, of learning by doing, of making and doing. And then I thought uh, the one I should mention that's relevant to the Bay Area is Pond Farm in Guerneville. Uh, that figured into our Jews in Mid-Century Modernism show because Margaret Wildenhain, the great ceramist, came to found an artist workshop in Pond Farm in Guerneville, which again was a place to make production pottery, but you learned by doing. And you have brought uh, to hundreds and hundreds of people and then rippling out effect uh, such an amazing uh, creative experience, but also I would say this, Barbara, you have another term for it. I call it reclaiming our past, reclaiming our history, reclaiming the narrative that was our narrative. And this is a form of empowerment for all of us around the world that in some ways history can't be rewritten, but it re can be recast in a new contemporary light and recalibrate our sense of loss because it's really about taking hold of now and of the future. So I wanted to commend you as artists for what you do. I happen to be married to a sculptor who makes every single thing by hand. <laughs> and it puts great emphasis on the making. As you, you made a wonderful comment earlier today about it's not about the end. It's the means to the end. It's in the doing and in the making. And in this case, um, I'm also very uh, interested in community arts. It's what happens when people come together across different backgrounds. There's a certain magic that happens through community arts, through the collective will and creative uh, synergy between individuals with teachers like yourselves, artists and teachers. So you give us hope as we look toward the future. I think so much of culture and culture making resides with people like yourselves um, and the excitement you, you elicit uh, from everybody who participates with you. Uh, in terms of museological, uh, I thought I would contextualize a bit of uh, those of us who are interested in museums and historic recreation. Uh, of course, in the US, I'll only talk about in the US, but you know, just to think about it a little bit, we have our historic recreation museum. So for instance, for 15 years, I worked at the Getty, where we had a first century CE Roman villa that was recreated also from drawings, mainly drawings, no photographs back then, uh, but drawings um, and archeological evidence, as well as poetry um, and uh, papyri, ancient papyri. And uh, that's an example of a whole museum that is a, a historical recreation. And if you've been there in more recent years, you'll know that it's been re-envisioned so that it is much more aligned with what an experience of a first century CE Roman villa would have been like. So I, I advocate your checking out um, the, the Getty Villa. 
uh, where incidentally they decided to go back to the original garish colors of what a Roman villa would have looked like. Uh, so not that kind of washed out, elegant uh, pastel, but like really kind of almost not, not very tasteful in modern terms, um, this kind of garish approach to historic um, uh, recreation. Another example I'll give you uh, is the Skirball Museum in Los Angeles. How many of you have been to the Skirball Museum in Los Angeles? So you know that it is designed by the architect Moshe Softy, and the roof line of the Skirball Museum might look familiar to you if you think back what the roof line looks like because it's very much uh, reminiscent of that hip roof line that we saw in the film of the original synagogue. So he's referencing Eastern European Jewish um, synagogue architecture in his modern day um, museum. He was also uh, very um, focused on, uh, how many of you recall the first century CE uh, synagogue floor of, that's mosaic synagogue floor that is from Tiberias that exists outside at the Skirball Cultural Center as part of the archaeology study center. So next time you're in Los Angeles, that's an example of an historic recreation of a first century CE. Uh, Jewish synagogue in Tiberias from Roman times. And what you'll see is a parallel there is the emphasis on the astrological symbols. Um, as we see here, we have uh, all of those are kind of astrological symbols of the goat and the Another one I wanted to reference for you is the Kiever Shul in Toronto, which is a recreation of a, a 19th century shul in Ukraine, which also has the astrological symbols and amazing fresco work. And that's in the old Kensington Market neighborhood of Toronto, where Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimlet was born and where she is from. And I would also reference uh, Meyer Kirschenblatt's amazing series of paintings, they call me Meyer July. It was painting from memory and recreating a history in his own oeuvre uh, as a naive painter, if you will, who rediscovered art at a very advanced age, um, but created this amazing corpus of work, which is also in itself um, a way of reconstructing history. The last example I'll give you, because it's top of mind and it's not here in the US. I mean, we can talk about Sturbridge Village and we could talk about um, Colonial Williamsburg, but we don't have much time. So uh, I'll just give the last example of being, um, oh gosh, no, I forgot what that is, uh, what that, what that uh, example in Europe is. But um, you will find these examples of historic recreation in various museum settings. Oh, I know the one. I was going to mention the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum and the amazing drawing series that Michal Rovner created in one of the barracks where children had been pr imprisoned. She recreated the children's drawings that were made while they were in the camp. She, fi she physically recreated those drawings in that space which is another form of historic recreation. And finally, I would turn your attention to the work of Yael Bartana, a contemporary Israeli video artist who herself in her work, particularly a, tr a tr triad of films called And Europe Will Be Stunned, also focuses on historic recreation. And I won't tell you what it's about. But now I'll talk about um, just the last piece, which is really the personal which is this wonderful museum in Warsaw, Pauline. Uh, when you go to the museum, you will see that the architecture outside isn't particularly organic because it's trying very hard to reference the urban nature of its setting. But when you go inside, it's very organic and very um, anthropomorphic almost, certainly biomorphic. And as I've told Barbara, it reminded me the first time I saw it and then the second time I saw it of a heart, of a human heart 
that has been broken many times but has managed to restore itself. And I would say that this amazing recreation of this synagogue, both its, uh, its roof and its bima, is really the beating heart, the beating heart at the center of this amazing new museum. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful image. I think we have time for just a couple of questions. Yeah, Paul. Um, I have to say that I'm overwhelmed by the attention to detail and the craftsmanship and all of that that it, it was put into this project. But there's a concept that I have not heard all day, and that is the fact that from the day that the synagogue was built until the day that it was destroyed by the Nazis, it functioned as a sacred as a place for contemplation and prayer. And when I look at the picture there, I do not see any place where one can sit down and try and reimagine what it would be like to have been in that space and uh, thought about one's relation with whatever. But it's not, it's not there. And I, you know, that's missing. Thank you so much. What an important and, uh, comment and question. Who wants to feel that one? Uh, that is a, a, a well, I, I, actually, I don't, I, I think I'm going to hand this off. <laughs> I think you make a really good point, and I'm sure there were operational and other decisions around why it's not a space for that activity. But I think you make a fantastic point. I do. Uh, I don't need that. I have this one. Uh, well, there's a photograph that uh, the museum sent uh, to Laura and I uh, maybe six months ago. Uh, they're bringing, they bring a lot of people through the museum, but they brought a student group through the museum. And they have uh, you know, probably, I, I, I can't tell the number, maybe 50, maybe 100 students, young children, lying on the floor. They've given them pillows. And they're all looking up at, at the ceiling, and that you know just about brought us to tears because we thought that was a, an amazing opportunity for young people to contemplate and, and, and study the ceiling on their own terms and uh, as a group. And uh, so I just thought I'd add that. A minion I haven't heard yet, but why not, right? Um, yes. Um, in, the, uh, in this project that's on the uh, screen, there was something like. This project started as a, a, an art educational project, and we did. There was a, actually a fairly low percentage of Jews participating, and not by any uh, uh, plan, but just by the way things worked out. There's a lot of Polish students. Actually, about uh, a quarter of the students were Polish, and for from Poland, and they were recruited, if you will, or brought to the project, like the young man that you saw in the film, if you saw the film, uh, through the museum. And Hans House had a, uh, a, a agreement or a rapport with the museum where we would bring the students from mainly the U.S. because that's, that's uh, where we were based, and they recruited students from Poland. Uh, and some of the Polish students had Jewish roots, that's for sure. And there were certainly Jewish uh, students that came from from the U.S., but it was not a, uh, we were not targeting Jewish participants per se. We were targeting, or not, we, 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 we invited everyone. I was actually asking about Eastern Europeans, no matter what their religion I don't think you meant how many Jews were, how many, how many Eastern Europeans? How many? Just Polish. Polish, oh, okay. There were um, about 25% of, of, each workshop had about uh, probably 30 percent, 25 to 30 percent, would that be correct from, I, th I think, uh, polls participating in each workshop. Yeah. So uh, I, I can't, whatever that would be, 100 or so. Mm -hmm. I think we might have time for maybe just one more question. Yeah? Um, I just, uh, for one thing, I, I really want to thank you for your work. I have to admit the museum. I think it was just absolutely stunning. Yeah, signs have such a prominent position. 
The question was, how do the signs of the zodiac figure into Jewish synagogue architecture and or mural? Or the spiritual life of the Jews who went there. There's got to be a reason why they are featured so okay. prominently. So I think Francesco might be able to answer this yeah, more since, accurately since than I could. Up, uh, to Europos, it's, it, they're, they're factoring synagogue architecture since antiquity. That's right. And Greco-Roman antiquity very much influenced Jewish architecture. So that's why I was referencing the first century CE mosaic floor of the synagogue in Tiberias with the signs of the zodiac. That's what I meant by the astrological figures. Um, and there is an exhibition that is in development called um, Written in the Stars, which has to do with Jews and looking up at the night sky at the astrological um, shapes.